Hello and welcome to tonight's live stream from the Truth Proof Castle. And uh, I've got to say we've got a great guest on tonight, as you know by our title card. Uh, he's got a lot of things to tell Paul, a lot of stories, uh, been involved in a lot of things with Paul. So that's all going to be great. First of all, I've got to say a little bit of housekeeping here. We uh, apologise for the last, uh, I think it was two streams, we didn't get on air. Uh, a little bit of illness floating about, so, you know, it, it gets us uh, once in a while. I've got to say, thanks for everybody for coming on to tonight's stream. Uh, looks like we've got Wandering the North is in, Nickname is in, and, of course, Skyflower is doing our moderating tonight. So, welcome to the show, uh, Skyflower. Alison Bottles in. Uh, welcome, Alison. I've got to say, who else have we got? Gosh, I'm scrolling down, just bear with me. Patricia Adams Wright and Stargazer Eternal. Welcome to the show, you guys. Any new ones? Ian Slater and Steve Trees. We've got... I can't see any more. Moonbeam. Right, I've got to welcome everybody from the UK and around the world to the Truth Proof live stream. Here's the intro. And thanks everybody for joining tonight's live stream. Without further ado, we are going to go to Mr. Paul Sinclair. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Les. And great to be back. And uh, as people know, I have been ill, which is an unusual one for me. But uh, I think this is going to be an easy one for me tonight. And I'm really looking forward to speaking to one of my best friends. And he should have been on here loads, loads earlier, Steve Ashbridge. We've sort of shared lots of experiences together in remote locations. He's probably been there since we started this, going back a lot of years. So, Steve, welcome to Truth Proof. Thanks, Paul. Nice to be here. No, it's, it's, it's brilliant, mate. And uh, I don't know if you want to give people a little background information on you. You, you live about, what, 12 miles away from me? Yeah, I live in a town called Hornsey, just south of Bridlington. Been here most of my life. Um, met you, Paul, 20-odd oh, years ago. Far too many years ago uh, on the site, and you introduced yourself and asked me if uh, I had an interest in in this kind of subject. And the, the first time I met you, I actually thought you were taking the mic a bit, uh, <laughs> um, but it turned out no, you were you were legit, and uh, we sort of struck up a friendship, and we've been doing it ever since. Um, it's, I think it's true to say that we, you know, we've been all over the place in the last twenty five year, and you, you know. Not just on walls, we've travelled to speak to people. We've really put the miles in. I mean, I think it's work and family commitments that's held, not held you back, but sort of stopped. Well, life gets in the way. Yeah. So you've got last eight or nine years. Yeah, it's then the flow of what, what I've been able to do time-wise. But, you know, the, the fascination's still there and I still get there when I can. And, you know, I, I think if we hadn't seen some of the things we've seen, I've said it in the past, um, wouldn't still be going out there and doing it, but well, that, we've seen what we've seen. Um, it makes you think. It makes you realise there's more more to it, and uh, it's worth trying to get to the bottom of it and find the answers. Yeah, I agreed. I mean, when I first sort of told you about what were happening on the Wolds, and people have heard us talking about the East and the East Yorkshire Wolds and the North Yorkshire Moors, I, we're a little bit sceptical. Do you think, or how did you feel? Uh, it, it, what you were telling me was was quite fantastical in 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 its description, um, and because of the volume of what you were seeing and the regularity of it, it's not implausible. But I just thought, wow, that's the kind of thing that you you, you want to hear, but you don't believe it until you've seen it. And we'll probably go into detail, a bit more detail. But the first time I did come up, um, it. it it proved to be true, and and I think to this day is why I still 
I mean, I've always been fascinated, but that's why I still go out there and, yeah. and things because we saw so much um, up in the walls. It's it's strange how areas seem to become active and then die down. I mean, who's to say? Because we've been spending a lot of time, or I have, recently up at Bempton and Speeton and around there. Who's to say? that the walls aren't kind of flaring up with activity again. We just don't know, do we? We were lucky to have a farmer up, a, up and around Staxton, who, the guy with the sweeping cams in his bedroom, yeah, just filming day and night with big banks of hard drives, collecting all this data, getting in touch and, and highlighting that this stuff were happening. But that first night that you came up, it's, it's, it sounds a bit cliche, but it, that that were probably as active as it were, ever were. It, yeah, without a doubt, we sort of caught it in, in its at its at its peak. Uh, I know you'd filmed lights previously and showed me the videos, um, but it's not until you see it with your own eyes you, you kind of think, "Wow, this there's something is going on here." It's, yeah. It's, um, I mean, it, we, we we took a guy called Mark Sturdy up with us, didn't we, Mark? He would, I, I think Mark was just curious more than out, and he, yeah. he, he became a little bit frightened. Now, if, I don't think he listens to these streams, but he wouldn't mind me saying it. I can remember, I can hear him swearing now and saying, Well, we need to go. Let's uh, go. It, when, when he were looking at these things. So, just for people that don't know, because I've spent a lot, I've, we've done these live streams, Steve, and I've talked at various places, and people have heard me say, I were here, and I was Steve Ashbridge. So, yeah, yeah. So nobody knew who Steve Ashbridge were, as apart from yeah. people who go to conference conferences and things. Yeah. But it's good because of a course of this next hour, hour and a half, or however long this is, we can break down a few of these things. And would please send us some questions in capitals, people, and uh, mm. you know, ask Steve what you want. You know, if you, any anything that you want, really, you know, within reason. But that first night, just just describe a few pointers if you want. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... I got a call from yourself saying um, I'm going to go up on the walls where we've seen all these lights. I'd seen I'd seen some of the footage. Do you want to come with us? Now, I was sitting at home. I didn't have family then. I didn't have my, my boy, so I was sitting at home watching TV. And I thought, well, I've got what else am I going to do? Um, so I jumped in the car and I think I picked Paul up and we, we drove up to um, the junction there up on the walls near Octon uh, for anyone who knows the area. And we pulled into put what became sort of our viewing point, if you like. Yeah. And we jumped out. And I remember it was, I, I want to say it was October because it was a really dark night, really clear night, lots of lots of um, stars and stuff. And But it was really howling. The wind was sort of blowing horizontal almost. So <laughs> we got out of the car and I'm stood in the, in the middle, of, well, not in the middle of the road, but by the roadside in this country lane. And uh, I'm thinking, what am I doing here? It's freezing. And Paul's sort of straight away got your camera out. And within five minutes, you were getting quite agitated, as I remember sort of saying, well, I've normally seen something by now. And I'm thinking, surely you're not going to see something as quickly as that. We just arrived. And so I asked again, what, what had you seen? And you described these orange balls of light just appearing in the sky and, and, and just sort of hanging there. And literally, as you were saying it, I just spun around and looked over towards Sledmere, which was sort of uh, west of where we were. And I just looked in the sky and this, the, the orange orb just it just lit up and, and hung in the sky. And I said to Paul, is that what you're looking for? And, you know, quite excitedly, Paul, you jump on the camera and, yeah, that's it, that's it filming away and I believe it was there for about four and a half nearly five minutes just stuck just so st static in the sky now bearing in mind it was absolutely blowing a gale that ruled out a helicopter because it would have been swaying it, it ruled out your Chinese lanterns um, because they were just gone with the wind literally um, and this thing was just absolutely stock still for four and a half minutes but that wasn't the best bit as Paul was filming I was looking due south and there was I see a, a white light just appear in the sky didn't come well, from well, well Mark with us at this point well, Mark, Mark was with us yeah yeah it, it lit up um 
sort of a like a sort of car headlight size thing, and then it it started um, sort of raising and lowering and blinking on and off and seemed to go behind some trees and it was popping up and down. It was it was almost showing like it was displaying itself. So I was getting excited now. I've seen the orange light, Paul's filming the orange light. I'm looking at the white light thinking, wow, what, what's that? And I thought it was potentially a helicopter coming towards us, but the way it was sort of going behind tree lines, that ruled that out. So within about a minute or so of the, the, the second white, the first white light appearing, a third light appeared. And this one was much bigger. It was more like, almost like a full moon. Um, the other two lights were still visible. The third one appeared. And it was higher up than the white light. And it, very, it, was, it was a solid white ball. And it just dropped down from the sky very, very slowly. And there was a, which I, I subsequently learned the next day, because I think I drove up there to, to get a, a feel for the geography. There was a copse of trees and a pig farm and the the white light had dropped down behind the tree line so it was below tree level and the beam was so intense that it was shining through the trees so i just see this white light and it started to travel in a for, for, from my left to right through the trees and i say you see the beam coming through the trees and as it got to the end of the the line of trees the the small cops it just faded out. It just blinked out and disappeared. Yeah. So that ruled out helicopters, aeroplanes, anything. And, so, and I had not seen it. I was focusing in on that. You, you, were, you were, because you were so excited about your, your orange light, <laughs> because that's what you'd been filming. Um, you missed this, this thing happening in the background. And as you said, that was my first time on the walls and i just thought wow you, you know this is actually something is happening here yeah um and to this day we don't know what but something was happening well then over, over a period of what five or six years we yeah. spent yeah quite a a lot of long nights and up on walls in mm -hmm. various locations and where we were seeing this stuff and and you know, I want to get to some of the things you've seen and experienced, but where we were seeing this stuff is where, we'll not say it name at business, but that where where there's a farm and the farmer there stopped his vehicle to, to lock the gates, his son jumped out, their house is in a bit of a dip, they mm. had the mast put up to measure the wind speed, we couldn't even see their cottage or their houses because it's in dip, and this object just rose and mm. came towards them. I know I've spoke about it before, it did three little rough sketches of it, and we can't say it were landed, but it must have been, if it weren't landed, it could have only been like 10, 15 foot off the ground, and they describe it as big as a jumbo jet without wings coming towards them. Yeah. This is all in the same area. Another farm, what would you say, Steve, uh, half a mile away? Yeah, half a mile. And th that guy described seeing the spaceship going, as he worked, called it a spaceship, not my words, but him. Yes. Well, you, you told me that story, and he pulled up one night. This farmer pulled up when we were there, and he, he sort of, he, I think he recognised you once he sort of worked out what we were doing there, and you asked him to repeat the story, which he did, and he basically, word for word, how you described it to me a couple of three years previously. Yeah. Described exactly what he'd seen with the triangle UFO coming over and lights around it and... um. I think it hovered over his, his um he had a wood as well next to his farm and it was That's hovering. Correct. Yeah, followed it, he followed it through yeah. wood. And he yeah. was screaming to get in because yeah, was... his wife was, yeah. And mm. I think it was his his daughter and his son in law that had seen it, because you can see the farm from Octon, from which is the crematorium, if anybody's familiar with this area, and they were driving home and they'd rang him mm. to tell him there's a spaceship above farm. And, you know, int interesting. Um, and it doesn't add more credibility, but it helps a little bit. I think I think the son-in-law were a, an helicopter pilot. Right. Kind of rules out, you, you know, he'll know what's in the sky, should we say. So, well, I don't think he were. He were. And, it, uh, it was interesting that the guy was the very down-to-earth sort of farmer, um, but the story he, he repeated to me was the same story he had, you know, given to yeah. you. Yeah. 
it's just grown and grown. We, I mean, we've been up there, you know, we just because we talk, we go on talking about North Yorkshire and them forests, and we've talked about Bempton and Speeton, but I touch on Wolds, but I, I don't have anybody to share it with to validate what I'm saying. And I'm, in in you, I have, and we, we've sort of we've seen quite a lot of things up there. That I mean, we've we've actually chased these lights. <laughs> we did, and, we did. and you know, and you're not a bit of a reckless driver, this fella, uh, people. <laughs> not not wild, but you know, uh, you're not frightened to pursue some tell you, Let's put it that way. And uh, yeah, we, we've we've chased it, them on occasion. It, it seemed to be that every time you put your cameras down put them away we'd stand there for a while we'd see something early on and then we might not see anything for an hour an hour and a half and decide to give it up and then boom the the, the they just sort of lit up like light bulbs in the sky some nights yeah. and we did decide to follow one one night and we were tearing well uh driving driving. within speed limits but <laughs> yeah yeah and we could see it on the horizon uh, well, fairly, it seemed fairly close, but obviously in the sky. And as we dropped down the hill, there's a there's a sort of a dip, and typically, like just in the films, you come up the other side and it's gone. It just yeah. Bang. yeah. It, I mean, and we we've we've literally been. If we're at Cotton and Octon, we've drove not to York, but we've gone way towards York, trying to find the point of origin and then they've been behind us looking towards Cotton and Octon, which yeah. proved that they're, they're in that zone, if, if you know what I mean. It seemed that wherever we thought they were, when we camped there, they sort of, these lights moved on a little yeah. bit down the road. So, we did, we did this one element, we did see one repeated light, if you remember. On, guys. We, we, um, we, we saw one, we'd see a gold, look like a gold colour light in the sky quite frequently, but looking into it, I mean, there's there's better apps on your phone and stuff now, but it was actually a flight path for an aeroplane, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But set, that was a separate thing to the orange lights and the white lights. This was a, it was a very specific position in the sky and you could see um, when you got the binoculars on, you could see the nav lights. So we knew that that was something different. But it, we didn't it really... get distance that we were looking at it, and I think it was twenty-eight mile away, weren't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But the light would seem to to come on and disappear, but it was only disappearing because it was turning north and heading up the up up the middle of the country. So that, but, but we ruled that out. But the other stuff. So, so, so we'll 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 stay on walls for a little bit, then, Steve. I mean, we can jump back to them in a bit, but uh, hedge lights. Tell people about hedge lights. Well, well yeah, he hedge lights is a coin sort of we faced because it, there were certain things going on in the hedges, funny enough, that we, we couldn't explain. And there was a couple of really interesting ones that still baffle me to this day. Uh, one of them was, it was early days because we were still in the, in the, um, area where I mentioned where I'd seen the, the white lights. Uh, this, uh, this is the turn-off to Buttercram, isn't it? Butter, Butterwick. Butterwick. Butterwick turn-off. We're stood in a, like a, a farm entrance. And I looked towards the hedgerow and I could see an orange... Uh, uh, it was kind of an orangey red light and a white light. And my automatic assumption was push bike coming up this main road it's a, it's there's a, a road at the other side of this edge so we don't, we've got we've got yeah. fat we've got fields arable land yeah and a, and a row of hawthorn and all sorts of edges yeah. quite tall weren't they yeah and, and it's the sledmere to opton road that's I don't it know what they call it road so sorry for butting in but yeah old sledmere road yeah right. uh, we we see so yeah so we were kind of on the field side of the hedge row and the lights seemed to be on the road side of the hedgerow so red a, a orangey red light and a white light and the assumption was push bike but it was really really slow really slow slower than a push bike would even a push bike would be going and it, they kind of drifted up the hedge line and then they, they sort of came together and merged and i'd said to paul after paul i think there's a push bike coming up, up the road and then they, they, they sort of came together and disappeared so I said, I said, if that is a bike, somebody's just fallen off, you know, because it was, it was it were low. It was low enough to it, be a bike, weren't it? Yeah, it was, and it wasn't summertime, so it was cold and 
crap conditions. And so we immediately sort of jumped in the car and went off down Octon Road, or, or Sledney Road, whichever one it is. And there was just nothing, absolutely nothing. There was nobody in the, in the head. It wasn't a ditch. There was just um, a grass verge. There was nothing, nobody. There was no turn off. There was nowhere those lights could have gone to. But Absolutely. Were... And just describe how many properties are on that road. <laughs> None. None. The, the nearest yeah. farm is a quarter of a mile set, set back mm. from, from there. So, so we're driving up at snail's pace, top yeah. one, yeah, ed, edge road. Because we weren't imagining seeing this. We saw these lights, yeah, yeah. And that's and, and the bizarreness of it all is, not not that in that scenario, but most of the time we've got that farmer up at Staxton mm -hmm. ringing us up, asking us if we can see these things, yeah, because we're and, and we can and we're having these conversations with him, yeah, yeah. numerous times on the. On the phone, he's ringing, saying, "Can you see this light?" And and we were we were there filming it. Yeah. yeah. So was, he's yeah. Th that guy, you know, uh, I've, and I've not spoke to him in quite mm. a few years for no other reason than people would you, you just drift apart, don't you? He's got more footage, I think, of this phenomena than anybody. And yeah. cams, them cameras are sweeping twenty four seven, collect, and he's he just lives for it. Well, he had a DVD full of it, didn't he? Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. So we still haven't touched on the hedge lights. So, so that there was the there was the the red and white light in the hedge that disappeared, and then uh, it was it was fairly close time in the timeline to that to that incident, and we were stood in this exact same position, uh, looking actually into the farmer's field, and we noticed. There was, there, was the, there was the hedge row, the Hawthorne hedge, and then there's a couple of trees, three or four trees in this hedge row. And one of the trees was glowing. And Sounds it, bizarre, but it's true. It, it was glowing, and it had almost like a really weak torchlight sort of flickering through the leaves. Um, I don't know what a will-o'-the-wisp will looks like, but I imagine it's just dancing lights. And this tree was was lit up from somewhere, but because of where we were, like I said, the, the nearest farmhouse is probably a quarter of a mile away. Um, you just there was no source of light to make that tree light up. And I think Paula, remember, I set off running across the field to try and yeah, just, yeah to, to trying to try find point the the origin of the light. Yeah, there was no origin. There was no light source, but this tree was got. But it wasn't glowing in a way like if you'd put a, a torch beam on it. It was just, it was it was a really dull glow, and it was just sort of moving through the trees. It, well, it, I think you said before it was like opaque, weren't it? It was. Yes. It, yeah. It, it, it was a strange light and. What happened there for anybody who's half interested here? We, I were fixed on these orange orbs, just like I am over at sea at Bempton and Speed. Mm -hmm. That's what I were wanting to film because I find them fascinating when they're punching into ones, twos, and threes. But we really should have been making something of these lights. Yeah. Uh, probably now with better cameras. We, We've we got better be cameras, better. more cameras, more equipment. Yeah, uh, and and we missed the moment, unfortunately. But yeah. It's it will never leave here because yeah. there's just, just no way. A it. crazy name, like you know, glowing uh, hedge yeah. lights. Hedge lights. But, no uh, other tree, none, none of the other bushes, nothing around it. So, um, and before the, there weren't fireflies. The, we don't have that kind of thing really over here. There weren't fireflies. It was a dull, yellowy white sort of glow that was sort of flitting around the tree. And at the, at the other side of that road, so if we crossed over that road, there's a valley there, isn't there? Mm. A little bit further on, quite a deep valley. I don't know what they call it. I think we're close to what's called the Beasendale Valley. Uh, that'll, be near, that'll be near Thimber, which is all yeah. relative. And there's, uh, there's folklore of the, the, the phantom hounds and the, the, the spirit lights in the Beasendale Valley, which so we've got a history of this phenomena. But there were a they were a guy who worked for Plaxton's coaches in Scarborough, in Cape, Scarborough Stroke, Caton, isn't it? You know, it's mm. quite near where Sarah, but Ellie's daughter lives. He's driving along that road early morning, going to work, can see down into the valley and sees an egg shaped object. Can you remember talking about this? I do. It's, he doesn't know whether it's on the ground or just 
hovering off ground. You can't see no legs or anything. And there's beings outside of it. Mm-hmm. Carries on driving. He questioned. He contacted me and told me about it, but he questions why he carried on driving. So it's a metallic or pewter type egg shaped thing in bottom of this valley early morning. And I think we're probably going back to about 2004, you know, when, yeah. when, he, when he saw this thing and he carries on driving. So the area is active. We've got the farmer and the jumbo jet without wings coming towards him. We've got the other farmer and pursuing this thing through the trees. We've got my own sighting with Chris Short, Shorty, six foot five. I'm the one, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, what did it look like? It looked like a, I call it like a huge breadstick above some trees, Make, not making a sound, making a making us feel something like 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 I was like pumping, like you know what I mean, that that kind of feeling. But where is that when you were at Sledmere looking at this thing? Mm. It's literally about a mile and a half from Cotton. It the, the, once again certain locations, and and we, when we put that in the paper, when I contacted the paper and said we'd seen it. A couple came forward and said they'd seen it. You know, yes, but we've got, yeah, we've got concentrated locations once again producing. Well, in 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 this case, I don't think it were cap sightings. It weren't cryptid type sightings. It were UFOs as in structured type craft and lights, spheres of light. But it, 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 there were no shortage of it. It, it petered out. When do you think it petered out? About two oh nine to seven. Yeah. yeah, about nine. Yeah, um, we had a really good run up until about nine, and then, but we still kept going um, for quite some time after that. Just just yeah. because what we'd seen, um, it was still worth going just to see what there was. He'd see an odd fleeting glimpse of something, but you know, not not to the extent we'd seen in the early days. Uh, and people listening, that kind of exp- that kind of tells you we weren't looking at anything conventional. Because if, if it petered out in 2009 and it were aircraft, they're not going to suddenly switch off. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, yeah. uh, it, it, it literally did go a little bit dormant. The, the interesting thing as well, you've probably mentioned it in the past, but was pretty much nine times out of ten when these orbs lit up in the sky or something happened, you could guarantee within ten minutes there was a military presence. Yeah. There was either a helicopter literally circling where the orange orb had been, or I I remember one night we'd seen three or four, and the next thing there was two jets screaming down from the northeast. And they were low. And they were low and they did a fly past exactly where these lights had been. They kind of did a U-turn, obviously, a few miles down the road and then spun back and, and came back over again. Yeah. It was, it was almost always um, backed up with, with some kind of military presence, as if to say, well, it, it was two, two theories in, in my head and probably yours. It was either the military knew we were there and was, or not necessarily knew we were there, but Anybody who witnessed it, it was kind of their way of saying, oh, it's just military stuff, don't worry about it. Or they were genuinely interested in what the hell was going on out there. They seemed to be aware of it, but they were all, as like you've just said, 10 minutes behind the object. Yeah. Very rarely what object there mm. as, the, as the aircraft approached. In fact, that first night where we discussed that the orange jet, like you filmed for, for four and a half minutes, the helicopter came that time and circled literally where it had been so so while we're on with that then steve the helicopter you had a bit of a scare but well, not scare un, uneasy well, moment yeah uh, i i don't know for what reason or what possessed me whether you were unavailable that night or whatever but i was at a loose end so i thought i'm just going to pop up myself and, and see see what's what and i was in the same same farm entrance uh I'd seen a couple of things, but not just the usual sort of lights that weren't airplanes, but nothing he could sort of get excited about. So I'd seen a couple of things. It was getting on, and and I thought it's about time I pack up. And then a white light appeared uh, coming from the south, and I, and I thought my my eyes because I mean, it's similar to what I'd seen before, but this one was different. It was kind of swaying a little bit, which made me think that might actually be something, an aircraft. And I put my binoculars on and sure enough, it had nav lights. It was a helicopter. 
and it was it had its headlights or a main beam was coming towards where I was. Um, so I thought, well, I'm giving up. It's a helicopter. Nothing to see here. Get in the car and drive away from the junction towards Optum Roundabout. And the next thing, the said helicopter is literally over where I'd just been. And the beam, the searchlight around the area where I'd just been. And I just thought that was really, really odd because only I knew I was there. Mm. And it was almost like somebody knew. Or, I mean, they could have been looking for a missing dog. I don't know. But it was just a real coincidence that I was there looking at these things in the thick of it when things were really going on and this helicopter turned up and decided what seemed to look look for me so I rang you and told you about the helicopter incident and then you had your own helicopter incident to talk That's about correct. yeah and because I didn't know you'd have that that had happened to you till after um after th- that happened to me and then and this th- what we had what well, it were a Chinook and I were in my work van, Vauxhall, Vivara, you know, everybody knows what they look like, white van, <laughs> white van man. And me and phones, anybody that knows me, I'm pretty useless. I get I get my daughter's cast offs, but me and Mary had been been to buy two phones from Curry's, the little Nokia, the blue and blue grey ones. I don't know what model they were, but we got one each. Told the story before, but it's relevant because of your helicopter incident, should we say. Parked in van. Mary only came up with me because she hated me going to these places on my own. I don't know. She was like my bodyguard. <laughs> she just didn't like me going up there on my own, spending hours and hours sort of in these remote places. So we picked the phones up. We've only just got them from Curry's and we didn't even know number, really. Do you know? We'd not rang anybody, not done anything with them. They were on, they were activated. And I'd filmed an unusual aircraft and it was an aircraft. It, it was got a strange configuration of lights and I'm fil- I filmed it and I don't think it were all any more exotic than an unusual aircraft and it, it disappeared and next thing there's a light coming at us like you've just talked about and you see navigation lights and it's a helicopter but it's a big helicopter so we're in this farm entrance and the farmer knows us he's got an interesting subject himself because of the things he's seen so he invariably said to me and Steve Pull off road, parking farm entrance, shut the gate when you go. Uh, that's basically what he'd say. So we're there. There's a field opposite. It's on a bend, isn't it? There's a field opposite. And this this Chinook landed in the field. No more than like, I don't know, 50 yards away from us, if that. And shut down, lights off. I'd, I'd got a little Sony Handycam at time. She's got night vision, like black and white. Nobody's getting out of it. I can see. And Mary's saying, what are we going to do? I said, we we'll just sit here. We're not breaking no laws. We we'll just, but it's it's, it's unnerving because they're huge. These things and it landed. It weren't that close that it were moving van. Mm. So it sat there for about 15, 20 minutes. Next thing, it's lighting up. It's up. It's up in air. My phone goes. Number withheld. Nothing, and. Now, I don't want to sound like some nutty conspiracy theorist, but that, to me, I found that really unnerving and, and quite... <laughs> it were. What else can you say? Uh, do you know what I mean? And uh, this helicopter, it's off on its way. It's just a strange one. And I told you, I had not told you about it. You told me that you'd had this experience. And I said, well, because it must have been in close proximity, time-wise. Yeah, yeah, it was all around. All, all, well, the, all the nothing. stages Mary all spoke, happened yeah. within a fairly sort of tight time frame yeah yeah so we'll we'll sort of come back to um cotton and around that area you know we'll, we'll talk about the blue light at staxton and various other bits and bats but to, let's jump to bempton because when it died down we uh we, we realized it had tapered off and then i'd got rock anglers and a few trawlermen telling me that they'd seen unusual things Around the cliff tops and out at sea, off Bempton, Speeton, and and well, from Filey down to down to Willsthorpe, really, weren't it? Yeah. And uh, we started spending a bit of time up there. So, what about these squares of white light? Because it's not first time they've been seen. Gemma and Bob's seen them. That that's interesting. That. Um, so we we were on. I think we'd had. We were on. Our, we'd finished actually. I think we'd had a bit of a. 
We've been up there for quite some time, pitch black, Bempton Cliffs. And we're, we're deciding to just sort of pack the cameras and, and go, usual thing, pack the cameras and something happens. And I looked up towards the hedgerow, way off in the... This is between RAF base and Bridget and Centre? Between the base and the bird sanctuary, there's a hedgerow at the back. There's, some tre there's a tree line, really. And I saw this white flash, big white sort of flash light up, and it was a square of, of, of light. Now, it was one of those. It was quick, but I saw it. And I wasn't, I wasn't sure whether to mention it or not. And then Paul said, did you see that? And I said, well, yeah. What did you see? He said, well, I saw a white light. I said, I did. Um, I said, but mine was square. And Paul said, well, I've just seen a square. However, mine was way over towards, I think if I get okay. my dog, mine was way over towards the, the bird sanctuary, but Paul's was way over towards the, um, the, the bunker. So there's quite a lot of space in between. So the, we, we saw them in fairly rapid succession. So it wasn't like it could have been there one minute, it could have been there one minute and there the next, but it was, it was two separate incidents that we'd seen. We hadn't seen the same light in the same place. We'd seen well, we might have seen the same light, but it were in a different yeah. place. place. Uh, and it, it, the speed, because I never saw it where you saw it. And yeah. because you, I said, where were it? And you went there. And I went, well, no, I saw it over there. One of, one of the things you could say was square white light. I mean, there wasn't much moonlight, as I recall. It was a fairly dark night. And, people, you know, I've heard it said that it, it could have been a, a deer's backside because they have a white square. But these, these, these were more rectangular and... And much bigger, almost like signpost size, you know, sign size, they were, they were much bigger than a, a deer's backside. Mm. Um, and, and brighter than what a, a deer's backside would be as well in the moonlight. So that was a really interesting one because I wasn't even sure whether I was going to even mention it until you, you said the same thing. Yeah. And, and isn't it strange once again, because in daytime, I mean, that, that area, that visitor centre, thousands and thousands of people pass through it every year. In daylight, looking at the seabird colony, uh, and let's not imagine that they're all, they all get a glimpse of some unex type of unexplained phenomena. But I can tell you now that some of them do, mm. and some of them have reported it to the staff. Some of the staff have seen it. I mean, I've spoke to <clears throat> a few years ago a member of <clears throat> a staff who worked there who told me about seeing a red light, a sphere of red light, enter sea. And it were with a, a lady who works at a bakery in town or she were working part time there. They both saw it. I've not spoke to her. I've never got a chance to. I'd love to just to just to get a take on what she saw. But this square of light, these squares of light. 400 yards down to the left, we've got this hill. It looks like a hill when you stood on cliffs. When you get on top of it, the land's pretty level all the way back from it. Mm. Gemma and Bob. You know, my daughter. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'm setting a camera up on cliff top, looking out to sea. Bob and Gemma are just having a bit of chatter. It's a dark night. She's got my sh bright torch, shines it into distance, says, what's that square of light? Mm. Like, once again, you said a sign. Bob says, I think it's a sign on a post. Mm -hmm. Then he realises, because he, he's up there all the time with me, there isn't a sign on a post there. Puts his torch on it, and it just drops to the floor, and it's gone. We immediately went over. Nothing there. But what an odd thing. What it doesn't even seem to conform. Or what? Why? why sh I might be. I'm talking absolute rubbish myself here. What does conform to unexplained phenomena? But a square of light, the spheres of light. It's 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 a strange one, isn't it? And that night, and I know I've told some of these things before, but it's good to get your perspective because I've mentioned that you, if I've talked about Bob and Gemma's story, I've said me and Steve saw this square of light. Nobody knew Steve were. You know, I know there's plenty of people know you, Steve, but not none of these, a lot of people listening tonight. And uh, that night, Gemma comes home. She's staying at ours for a few weeks. We go to bed. She's sat watching TV. And she hears a rumbling noise, which she perceives as thunder. Turns telly down and she says, right at the back of me, right at the back, there's a growling. It's a brick wall. Mm. There's a brick wall and a passage that's part of our property, so it's not next door's. She said, and it's that loud, I can feel all my insides vibrating. It's terrifying. A growling. Now, if we, if we, I hate to use the cliche of skinwalker, because I think what's happening around Bempton and these cliff tops, 
can stand on its own two feet. It doesn't need that. But if we use the examples of people who've been there saying that they've had some kind of attachment, they call it the hitchhiker effect, mm. then I believe that that could be what's happened. Do you know what I mean? Because they, Bob's had lots of weird experiences mm. uh, after being on them cliff tops. Things have happened in the, fl in the flat that he's in. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it 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 brings well. The other thing with Benton was we saw the white lights, the squares after been going a few months, as far as I recall. But the very first time I went to Benton, you'd been going for a couple of weeks, I think, before I went there, and you described these lights, five lights coming on in sequence, sort of as as, as one. One would come on, a second one would light up, and then a third one, but the first one would go off, and so the lights would kind of come off in sequence. Look up in the sky, been there half an hour, boom, the lights just appeared. Um, I, I, different perceptions, I, I suppose they were so fast you could, you, people might see them differently, but I saw them as almost teardrop shaped lights with a sort of elongated, with, with a sort of a round bit at the top. And they just they just went along along the um, along the sky, and we saw that a couple of times, and we went up the next time and we saw it again. But this time it was it was really cloudy, so we could see it happening. We could see the lights kind of yeah, cloud. like clouds, but you couldn't see any definition. And it happened about five or six times before the clouds cleared or um, the lights sort of came from behind the clouds and once again lit up in the sky as clear as day just um it, it, that, you was, know, it, that it, was happening regularly it is hard to get not get through to people explain because we've had these these sort of rich times when we've seen these things on walls and seen them out uh, up at bempton it's, it's quiet at bempton at the moment and mm. um, you know me, myself and bob now the touristy, the bird spotters have sort of tapered off. We, we and it's getting darker. Yep, yep. We've been going up, oh, three or four times a week. Mm. Experienced nothing, absolutely nothing. And you're putting hours and hours and hours in. So, so I think people. And this is this is not to put people off going to look because it, I, I I always say it. The, the probability of seeing something, I think, is much greater in these locations than than other places. Uh, you know, I think I think it, it really is. But but don't go expecting it to just happen because we, we we're there three, four, five times a week, and it's not happening at the moment. However, uh, a few weeks ago, there was a guy called Patrick came up. He was camping uh, up on a site at, at Flamborough, and myself and Bob. And we didn't know this guy. He contacted me afterwards. Myself and Bob could see the air, air sea rescue helicopter out at sea. It was around the headland to Flamborough Head, and he's there watching it. And he con he contacted me the next day. He said he'd seen the helicopter. Said the time. I said, yeah, we well, did see that. Then it went around headland. He said, well, a red light just appeared in the sky, stationary, not not part of helicopter. Helicopter moved towards it. The red light switched off. And it just opened up a little bit and switched off. So, you know, just, so things are happening. I mean, there might be a perfectly plausible explanation for it, but they are happening. But before we touch on some other stuff, Steve, let's just see if yeah. Les has got uh, any questions. I hope people are finding this interesting because I'm just, I love talking with Steve. It's, it's, it's like, it's just like just catching up every time, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah. Interesting. Really interesting uh, so far, guys. Uh, uh, it's fascinating show. Nickname has got a question in, and Nick Nickname <coughs> has asked, has Steve any counters, has Steve had any counters prior to knowing Paul? Great question. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, a couple of, I, I've, I've been into the, interested in anything sort of, um, of air, incidents of high strangeness since I was a kid, since I can remember. It's always been of interest to me, but th there's there's encounters I've had that have been, let's just say, you might call them spirits, ghosts, whatever, uh, things moving around. That's a separate story. Um, but as far as 
things in the sky. Yes, um, I, I once followed a classic cigar shape orange UFO. I lived in a village called Alborough, not far from from where I am now, and I, I saw this classic orange cigar shape UFO just just cruising through the sky. It wasn't a blimp; it was the whole thing was lit up orange, um, and I, it was it was going over the village, and then. As I, it sort of went behind some houses uh, on the horizon, as, and as I came around the corner where and should have seen it appear, I, I must have watched this thing for two minutes, and then as I came around the corner, boom! It, it was just, it was just gone. And then there was another really interesting one, which again was was the same village, Albra, and it, it was around about bonfire night. And the reason I remember that was because what we'd seen, funnily enough. With this story, one of my friends, Eddie, I, I can remember other people being there, but I couldn't remember who. And I started telling the story a few weeks ago. My, my pal, Eddie, who, who I hadn't seen for a while, he said, I was there. I, I remember what, what, what we saw. So that corroborated my, my story. And we were looking over the horizon, to, over towards, what would it be, north, west, towards a village called Withenwick. And... I saw a, a big red light in the sky. This was red, red, not not orange, bright red. And then a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. And basically it formed a perfect hexagon in the sky, but it filled a large portion of the sky. So this thing was, or things were, were, were covering it. It wasn't in one small area. It covered a vast part of the sky. And there was six of these objects and they didn't move an inch. But what they would do was fade away come back on, fade away, come back on. And they're all in sequence. No, it weren't a sequence, sorry. They were just randomly turning on and off. And they were. we must have watched them for minutes, not seconds, but minutes. And then eventually each one just faded away but didn't come back. And that was one that I really, to this day, <laughs> I don't have an explanation for. Um, a few other bits and pieces, but, yeah, they were the, the, the main two that, that stick in my head. From yeah, so, and that was yeah, I was I was only sort of a uh, young teenager at the time, so yeah, a long time before I met Paul. Yeah, I'll just add a quick question from myself there, Steve. Uh, do you think some people more are more um, can tune into these things more than others? Some people, you know, a lot of people don't report these things. It may be because they don't see them, Steve. Do you think that's the case? It, it, it's a possibility. I, I I think whether they actually see them physically. You, you might see them, but not. It might not even register with them. Uh, Paul Paul touched on a guy, uh, Shorty, who we both know who, who witnessed the UFO with Paul, and he kind of just shrugs it off like it, it didn't happen. Or it was one of them UFO thingies. It, it's, it doesn't really register with some people, or it, or reverberate with some people. They just don't actually feel the need, or they just shrug it off and say, oh, "It's just imagination." Or a, it's, it's difficult. It's, it would. I think it would difficult. I, for him to get his head round. I, I, I rem we'd got a mutual friend, Gary, who was, who was Shorty's friend, mm -hmm. and I pushed him and pushed him, do not say you've not seen this tomorrow, because mm -hmm. that's how it was close. We could mm -hmm. feel it, whatever it was, we could feel its presence, not hear it. And yeah. we were still looking at it, and I'm saying, do not say you've not seen it tomorrow, Shorty. Do not say you're looking at it now, because he's one of them that just, ah, all a load of rubbish, you know. And we got to work. He were really enthusiastic. He, he described it in detail. He, he were really for it. And then it, that just dissipated over a few days and over a week. It went, oh, yeah, we saw something. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know what, though. You know, and strange. That's just the effect it has on people. Mm. So, yeah, maybe people just aren't. The, in answer to your question, they might be seeing it and not. it just doesn't register as anything particularly, you know abnormal mm. okay great uh, i've got a question from aldo rain uh, aldo it's a question for you paul actually okay has paul ever, has paul ever tried to contact any of the armed response police who were up on the cliff top cliff tops uh, looking for the alleged uh, lion back in the nancies on what basis were they there uh, the 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 armed response police it were 1994 they weren't on cliff tops uh and I hope I've not misled you by thinking that they were. It were at Rudston Parva, which would have been about how far, Steve? Six mile away? Five or six mile? Yeah, about yeah, about five or Rudston six. Rudston Parva. And and no, I haven't. And and 
the, the helicopters from RAF Leckham Field were up looking for this lion. Uh, I do know that uh, a groundsman at a, a large hall, very close to Rudston Parva, claims he followed something on two legs covered in fur with a shotgun through, th through, through the woods. Because he says to me, that were no lion. Uh, and uh, But the lion, everybody... The people that described it, it was it was seen by numerous people. It was it was seen by a lady called I think it was Margaret Chadwick and her husband, and they saw it at Rudston Parva under a tree. They thought it was a large uh, Jersey calf laid under a tree. They were waiting for the flower show to open up at uh, oh, Burton Agnes Hall, and they, they were early, so they sat waiting. They got some pictures of it, and I think I've I've got well I've got the picture. She wouldn't let me have the picture, even to scan. She let me take pictures of the picture, and I think I've put that in probably the the second book. And she said, and it stood up, and it, for all intents and purposes, it was physical. It was nothing paranormal. I mean, it could have been some escape from a zoo or a circus. I don't know because it was physical. She said it stood up, and when it stood up, its tail stood in air, and it actually sprayed the tree. And then it just walked off and went through into a cornfield. So whatever they saw were physical. It was seen at Walgate by a painter, painter and decorator. I can't remember his name, driving home from Bridlington. And he said he drove alongside of it. It were a lion. But the only thing I've got supporting that it was something cryptic or really unusual is, is the groundsman at the hall. And I'm not going to say which hall because he's still there. And he said he followed it through with a shotgun and it were on two legs. And it's, it's interesting because around the same time, we also have the report from the guy at Grindle who said that he saw that thing jump over the hedge and land as though it were on Velcro. Oh. And when he were poaching. And it, it, it fox cover wood at Grindle. So, so once again, we, you, you've got like this, you've got this hive of activity and then it just dissipates, it just stops. Where would a lion go? <laughs> unless, unless the authorities did shoot it and then just suppressed it and never said a word. I, I really don't know. So no, to get back to your question, it wasn't on the cliff tops. It, it was at Rudston Parva and can't remember the amount of police. Did you say 21? 21 armed uh, police? I think it were. I've got the I've got the newspaper report and everything to accompany it. And uh, and it was seen in a garden. And and I, I won't say <laughs> the court lady Debbie and her surname's really unusual. So I'm not going to say who it was, even though newspaper of the day did say who it was. And it was there. The children were looking at it and they got mum and dad to come and look. And it's there, laid in garden. So, yeah, a lion. Uh, I've got a question from Patricia Adams Wright. Hi. And, uh, yeah, hi, Pat. Uh, what are both your top sightings while you were together? Ooh. What, who wants to start there? Uh, yeah, uh, well, we were going to talk about the, tur the turquoise light. Turquoise light. Uh, was phenomenal yeah well we, let's not just trying to work that happens, one in then. later yeah right yeah so um we're back of staxton wold uh where the <laughs> radar base is and there have been some sightings of there. i think some black cat sightings and things like that paul and some farmers had seen some bits so we decided to re camp up there for a while when 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 the world had gone quiet and we're with a chap called joe um, joe dormer, joe dormer who used to run the Yorks UFO club. Yeah. Um, he, he it was his first time out. He he wanted to come with us and do a sky watch. So I went to drive to Scarborough, picked him up, and then we ended up at the back of Staxton. And again, saw a few bits and pieces, nothing you could actually say that, you know, of any, any significance. But um, Paul just went, oh, my God. Oh, you should have seen that. I wish you'd seen that. Because um, Joe and I were facing one direction, Paul was facing. Um, I was looking towards Driffield. Driffield, yeah. And so we said, "Well, what is it?" He said, "This massive dome of purple light just lit what? up. It came up up from the floor, and it was just huge. And it was a so, sorry, not purple turquoise, turquoise, turquoise light. And so we spun round as you and would, got, would do. Just to just to put in a bit, because I want yeah. you to do the story. I'd got in my hand this Sony VX twenty one hundred. Not on. Why didn't I put it on and start filming? That's so annoying. So I, I was explaining it, and I'm thinking, how do I validate this? Because nobody's going to believe me. These two are with me. They didn't see it, yeah. and I'm explaining to them. So they off you go. Sorry, Steve. 
No, it's fine. We'd both seen enough things that if, if one of us saw something the other one didn't, we, you'd be, you believed each other. We'd both seen, we'd been up there for so long. So if Paul had said, I saw a, you know, a three-legged dog with glowing green eyes, I, I would have believed him. But he's describing this turquoise dome. So we spun round to look on the off chance and just out of nowhere from the ground up, this huge turquoise dome just ballooned out of the ground again. And it, it was it was must you can't describe the colour. It was no, absolutely sure. beautiful. And it beautiful. Had, looked like it had sort of rivulets running down it, down the sides of it. It was, uh, I, I've i never seen anything like it. I've seen electric sort of explosions where uh, a substation blows up, videos of course, where it blows up and there's a big turquoise light in the sky. But this this formed a perfect dome, but it came from up, from the ground and, and, and it covered a huge area of the, the horizon it wasn't a small thing um so whatever it was went off twice because paul we, described we Perfect. thought it were going to be on news mm -hmm. we thought people would be talking about it because as steve said from where we were looking at it it covered a monstrous area and it, it they were black above it it weren't l l illuminating the sky above it or anything and but we just thought well there's bound to be somebody driving within this or, or uh, property somewhere be some some houses, some buildings, some roads, some cars. It must have done. It was it was vast. Excuse me. But nothing. There was nothing on social media, nothing on the local news uh, websites. Just just nothing. It, but it, it was it, a really really spectacular thing to see. And, and so, so when Pat asked what what most interesting thing, but that that's probably one of the most interesting things I have seen up there, and it lasted probably. A second said so hmm. two seconds i don't think it could have lasted any longer but it was just the intensity and you could see inside it you could see through it yeah yeah uh, uh, but the color it was beautiful it was just it was just amazing really uh, i've never seen anything like it now that could be there might be somebody listening to this after and be able to tell us it's some kind of earthbound phenomena hmm. do you know because there were like tentacles inside it it was weird yeah. If they can't, that'd be brilliant because it's it's one that still I think about regularly and cannot. I, I Google it every now and again. I start uh, turquoise flashes have been seen all over the world. But do, not, do we do we not, have a picture of that that you you sent Les maybe of not not of the actual turquoise light, but your uh, interpretation of it that Les might be able to put a little lock up. It, it's not great. I just did it on my phone. So if if Les has got it there, I apologise for the quality, but it'll give you an idea of of what what it was like, um, albeit the colour on the picture I did is, is a solid colour. Um, it wasn't It wasn't a solid colour um, when it happened. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> so there you go, Pat. Uh, one, one to two second sighting. I think going back to, to my, when we were together, I think that first time the light came down from the sky and went behind the tree line and disappeared. There is no, expl there is no explanation for that from a a helicopter airplane point of view so that was the one that really i went wow what the hell is going on yeah um but they say you were filming the orange orbs at the time so you did there's, there's so many things and I, I think and i don't mean our audience because i know they're all switched on and looking and people are really interested otherwise they wouldn't be i don't mean listening to us but listening to podcasts of a similar mm. kind of thing but you know me myself mary jessica and nick one of my daughters and her boyfriend, we went to a place called Ox Pasture Hall uh, to look at the venue for their wedding. And Nick's a little bit, I mean, if he's listening to this, he'll know exactly what I mean. If we've got, if it says we've got to be there at one o'clock, we've got to be there at one o'clock. They couldn't possibly, even though when we got there, we were sat down for 45 minutes waiting for them to, to come and like run us through everything. But anyway, as we're driving to Ox Pasture Hall, I've, I've got the camera in the car, but in the boot, it's a bright sunny day, and I think we were up to about roughly about Octon or just before not Octon, sorry, Osgoby, just before Osgoby. And there's two jets flying in the sky, and they look like they're about this far apart as you're looking at them at the distance. Bright sunny day, and I'm looking at them, and there's a there's something like a pencil, a silver pencil, not quite as long as jets, but long in between them in the sky independent and i'm and i said to jess i said can you see that 
And she just, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, stop the car. I want to film it. Oh, we've got to get to Ox Pasture Hall. We've got, yeah. And and I'm sat there like, <laughs> you know, and it was there. So it's at the most unusual things. You see, I suppose it wouldn't be unexplained. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be this what we're looking into if it if it didn't happen at the most awkward times, at the most in you know inappropriate moments that you've seen these things i mean we've got a story in wolflands and i'll not go into detail but someone was seen at a, at a time when this guy you know maybe didn't want to see it. <laughs> i don't think anybody wants to see these things but yeah it, it's there everything nothing everything takes you by surprise it's all there last minute when you least expect it bang it's in your face but uh any more questions les yeah, I've got. I'm going to slip on an ear from uh, Chris, um, Outer Limits magazine. Welcome to the show, Chris. And he was just uh, asking on a topical uh, story, and it was about the UFO picture that was printed in the Hull Daily Mail this week. Have you either of you ever seen it? And do you want to comment? Have you seen it, Chris? Uh, sorry, Steve. I've not seen that one. No, I've seen it, and it, it is interesting. It's it's two hazy lights. I, I don't know whether it's motion blur or whether lady who's taking pictures just moved slightly. What I find in more interesting, Chris, is the fact that this week we've got, once again, this paranormal soap being stirred up because I'm not going to say where I've got the report from because we, 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 we're sort of still, we're, we're ongoing with this one. Uh, 27th, which would be Tuesday, 9.15, a triangle allegedly, all lit up, 999 calls gone in, entered sea at Willsthorpe. Once again, September, it was September 2009 that we'd got similar things happening. So we've got the report of UFOs, these lights that, that Chris has just brought up. We've also got in the Scarborough Evening News, and I don't know what to make of it, people, so don't uh, jump on me, but we'll, but it's a strange one. Somebody, we know that they can't live in cold water, but somebody's filmed something that looks like two crocodiles. So if anybody's not seen this, get onto Scarborough Evening News and have a look at the footage. So they're at, they're at the Blue Dolphin Holiday Park, which will be about eight miles from where I'm sat now. So it's not quite Scarborough, but that's the paper that's covered it. Walking along the cliff tops, and he's seen these things. The son, I think it is, the little boy's seen these things, and they've got and had a good look, and they filmed them. Said they were crocodiles. It's impossible. <laughs> Do you know? I, I was working in Hull up till a few well, a few weeks ago uh, at uh, Warren Road, a place called near Warren Road, uh, Kingswood. Eight o'clock in the morning, I'm stood on my office balcony looking <laughs> looking over the site, and it was a really really clear sky there was some high level cloud but it was a really really sunny beautiful morning and i just see this black thing and it i can't say it just appeared but it, it it wasn't there and then it was and this perfect black ball just flew across the horizon and i i, I filmed it but as paul knows, i've got a p900 but it was in the car, and by the time I'd gone down the stairs and got the car and gone back up, I probably would have missed it. So I had to film it on my on my iPhone, and I got it was a bit shaky because I was zooming in, I was losing the, the image a little bit. But this thing was a perfect black ball, and it just went across, and then it changed trajectory, and went sort of basically up in the sky. There was a couple of times where it seemed to be flashing really brightly. Now. I couldn't make out whether they were actually flashes or reflections from the sun. But either way, it was, I've never seen anything that clearly in daylight that wasn't an aeroplane or a, or a mm. helicopter. And, and a balloon, it, it was round. It was, it, was, it was a perfect, looked like a perfect ball to me. It didn't look like a balloon. But a balloon wouldn't have behaved the way it did. It was noiseless. There was no vapour trail. There was nothing. It just black ball just floated along and then and up in the air and yeah. i did a little bit of footage of that i thought that was really interesting yeah you sent it uh and i, I i've kind of messed up there because i ought to have asked les uh, asked you to send it to les we could you, we could have had a look at that well i can i can forward both sections of film on but one does need a bit of a steady up if you can steady the image yeah. um, it's it's kind of 
rolling up and down. Well, that's probably just due to you holding it, isn't it? You know, it's difficult, isn't it? Les, have we more questions? Yeah, I was just going to say, Steve, that wasn't with the gin, was it? Uh, <laughs> I'd been drinking gin that day. I knew somebody would bring that one uh, up, Les. Yeah. No, that was right, uh, morning. I don't start till 10. Right, yeah, that's cleared that one up then. Okay, yeah, and uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping here. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody who's wished me a happy birthday. It is my birthday week, as uh, Scarflower has pointed out into, in the chat. So thanks for all the... Uh, Good wishes, and uh, yeah, it's, I've got to a point in life where birthdays, you, you don't really relish them coming, really. You like the presents, but you don't relish the number. <laughs> where it the number you. that comes with it, Lesser. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for that. And um, at this juncture, I think we'll ask Paul if he's uh, got any merchandise for sale, and if he has, uh, where can people find them? Well, I... As we as we do most weeks, we've got the website truthproof.uk. The Kindle versions of the books are available on Amazon, but the paperbacks are, are on the website truthproof.uk. And uh, yeah, that's if if you want a copy of the book, contact me if you want beforehand. If you want me to write anything in it, I'm quite happy to do that. Uh, you've no need to ask me to sign the books, people. I, I, I know people have asked me, but do you know something? I sign everybody's book every book I send out and I have done from day one because it's no hardship I think people think they're prima donnas don't they and they want some money for signing a book as though it's some some big big deal it's that it's easy so if you want a book truthproof.uk and anything else I can help people with just just hit me with it and if I can I will uh, my head's been a bit of a mess last few weeks I, I really believed a few weeks ago my time were up I said I was going to put a picture on Les, and I'll have to put it on because it just looked like I'd, my face, just literally everything had swollen up. It was just, I couldn't believe it. So I don't think there's anything else after that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, well, as we get reports in and we get lots, quite a lot of reports in, and they're all unique to the area, or some of them are well out of the area, but Don Lodge... Who, who runs the website, he, he, he puts the reports on, he'll, we'll, we'll sort of discuss what, if we need to ask the person who submitted the report, ask him a few more questions. Sometimes Don does that, or I'll do it. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's some, there's, I don't know, going on for probably 200 reports on now, and they're all original. And I've said to other people, if, if you look at the website and you've got a website of your own and you want to use them, take them, use them. Just give us the bit of credit for for finding the information out that's all we're asking and other than that yeah we're good to go and anybody that wants to ask about wolfland and we know we keep saying it's close but believe me it really is close and uh we're working on it quite hard uh les has been on it a lot more than me last few days this illness has left me a little bit wrecked to be honest and uh but he's been working hard on it and uh, we've been ironing out audio and all sorts of things. And yeah, I'm, 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 I'm really happy with it myself now. So over to you, Les. Okay. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, I'm going on to some questions now. And the question is this. Alison Buttle. Uh, hey, Steve, with all the ex your experiences, what is your opinion of it all? Do you want to answer that one now, or do you want to leave that one to, to near the end? Um, no, I mean, uh, it, my honest answer is I haven't got a Scooby. Um, I do know what these things aren't um, that we've seen. I do know we're not seeing helicopters, aeroplanes, Chinese lanterns, swamp gas. What I don't know is what they are, there's, but there's certainly... <sighs> There's certainly something going on we can't explain. I, I, I don't have a, a big theory. Um, I, I, I've never said there's little green men in spaceships, but what I have said is I, I know what they're not, but I don't know what they are. Mm, that's uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't add anything to that. I've just seen Sky in chat say, because I did call because I, I wanted to call it to see her. I nearly said her name then, uh, about something when I was ill. And we didn't know if it was contagious, so I didn't go in. And she saw me, and she was quite shocked. So, yeah, I'm glad you've said that, because you did see me. We must put a picture up, not because I want people to have a laugh, but it's quite horrific. I looked absolutely shocking, and whatever 
got hold of me because they said it was shingles and it weren't in the end and they, they don't know what it was. So more questions, oh, less, please. Yeah, I've got a one from uh, Steve Lewis. And uh, I know you talked about your top sightings, Steve and Paul, but uh, he's ask, Steve is asking, what's the sighting that has truly disturbed you? Question for you. Um, Steve, yeah, yeah, go for it, Steve. And... It, this, this is a weird one. Um, and it, it could have been one of many things, but it, I don't get spooked easy, but we were at, um, Paul will remember this, we were at, uh, in the early days up at Cotton, near the, the, the gates to the... I know uh, what you're talking about, yeah. Ball of top. Top. And it, it was a clear night when we got there. We'd been there for so long, we knew every light in the sky. So we knew where the farms were, we knew where the, the street lights were, the roundabout of the road. We knew all what we called the earth lights. So we knew that anything that wasn't an earth light was kind of something different. But I said to Paul, the farm lights have disappeared over there, must be fog rolling in. And then the roundabout lights disappeared and the fog was getting closer. And eventually, literally every single light on the horizon disappeared. This thick pea soup fog just came over the top. And we, I mean, the car was feet away. We couldn't even see the car, could we, Paul, if you remember? It was, it was, it was, it was yeah. it's fog, I remember. And then I was just, it, it, I think uh, Paul probably won't mind me saying this. Paul's getting a bit edgy at this point. Mm, yeah, yeah. Oh, so I think we should do one, and I'm, th and I'm thinking well, actually it's quite spooky. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have liked to have been there on my own, but it, you know, having Paul there as well, it kind of took the edge off. But I looked up, and I, I could sense rather than see this black shape just went over my head, and it, it's hard to put a, a size on it because of the fog. So it kind of it, it, it plays with your perception, but this black raggy shape just went over over the top of my head now you could say a bat you could say a crow you could say whatever and then i think did i even see that so i spun i went oh and i spun around really quickly and i saw this thing go uh, carried on over my head and then it just went and it just took a right turn and just disappeared and <laughs> well the, the the nearest thing i could liken it to was the the creature out of jeepers creepers that's what it felt like it, it just silently just swooped over my head and looked. But it was it was split second, so I, you know I couldn't make out details. But this black form just flew over my head and then turned right and and I saw it twice. So the, the first time I knew it wasn't my imagination because I saw it again as I spun around, and that did whether it was just the um, the fact that it was a foggy night and it was in a spooky place, but that really creeped me out. Uh, yeah. No. No. No UFOs or anything like that, but it was a really... But another incident happened there, if you don't mind going on with that. Um, no. There was another one that creeped me out in the same place, funnily enough. And it it was a different night. It wasn't foggy. It was a clear night. Is this Voices? Yeah. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and I said to Paul, what's that? And he said, what's what? I said, you must be able to hear that. And he couldn't hear anything apart from the, the general night you know, owls and, and whatever. And as clear as bell, I could hear a metallic voice. It wasn't speaking a language. It was just like a metallic voice. And it sounded like it was coming from the hedgerow nearby, near where we were. And I'm saying, can, can you not hear that? And he said, Steve, there's, there's nothing there. But it, there was, there was a, a metallic, and it was almost as though it was coming over a radio receiver. It wasn't, it wasn't a voice like I'm talking now. It was almost like it was coming over a radio receiver. And it, it almost repeated itself numerous times. And I've racked my brains and I cannot, cannot fathom. We were, we, you know, as Paul mentioned, the nearest farms a quarter of a mile away, half a mile away. The, I don't know what was producing that noise, but the fact that I could only hear it as well. I know people's hearing is different and you hear different frequencies, but it was loud enough that I was just, absolutely bamboozled with it yeah I, uh, well you were looking around the edge you were you were uh, yeah I, I, I couldn't hear a thing but do you know jump into but, Benton go on sorry yeah. well I was just going to say um you were in Dane's Dyke 
only well, the yeah. last couple of years, and you said you heard metallic voices in, in the, the trees. The, 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 yeah, the north side of Dane's Dyke, the part that nobody hardly ever goes, unless, well, they, they just don't. And uh, early morning, I've got Wolfie with me, and we're travelling through this bracken, which is really high, and we hear a robotic voice. Hmm. I just thought, Christ, what is this? And I could hear it. And you think to yourself, is there somebody in there with a walkie-talkie? It's, it's almost <laughs> like crackly. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. I, and I couldn't see it. And, and it unnerved me so much, I thought, do I walk back? There was a field with the purple stuff, the borage in it. Mm. Excuse me. Uh, do I cross that field? Don't like... Uh, well, I don't. I just don't cut through fields, just trampling on crops. I considered it. I, mm. I went back in end and went back because I had to go. I did the sweep looking for these when it were at peak of when the animals were being killed. Yeah. And uh, the sweep of the field dropped into wood, come back through wood, then do the field again. Uh, or go, go back through the field. And then I went back. But yeah, it really unnerved me. And the farmer sat on his decking. Mm. And uh, I'm having a cup of tea, coffee, beer, I don't know. Heard some weird voices last night. I'm not saying the same night, by the way, but it, it went in similar time frame. What did you hear? It's, and there's a field of corn or barley, but it's there. You, we all know it stands about 28 inch high, whatever. And uh, so it, about there, about 10, 20 foot away. No tracks, nothing. They are a metallic, robotic voice. What are we listening to? Like... Is it, is it the same phenomena? I don't mean the, I don't mean it's followed us from walls, by the way, but is it, we're dealing with something very similar. You know, it's, it's, it is, it's fascinating. A couple of, so, yeah, a couple of quite spooky things going on. Ironically, none of them related to lights in the sky, but... No, wait, I don't think it has to, Steve. I think that there's a connection uh, to it all, in, in, in my humble opinion, but I think what we've got is... I don't, one might not be aware of the other. It might be just something within the environment, something within this this realm of unexplained phenomena that's enabling lots of things to come through and, and be activated. Uh, mm. I, I know Les has probably got another question, but I just, I just want to talk about something that might not be unexplained phenomena, but I find fascinating. And um, because I've tried to tell the story before, but I think you can tell it better than me. And that's Mr. Blue Skies. Oh, Mr. Blue Sky. Yeah, let's do this. Yeah, this this was uh, this is Can one. That... All the background about the subliminal. Yeah, message? yeah, yeah. Everybody has sort of synchronicity um, in their life at some point, déjà vu or a, a coincidence or something. Um, Paul and I were up on uh, Cotton, uh, and and as as you do when you you're up in the fields, up on these roads for hours on end, you start talking about anything. And the, the subject of music came up and Paul and I's music tastes are completely sort of um, different. And I mentioned that um, ELO had just played, I think re recently they were playing uh, the whole stadium, whole, whole, whole KCOM stadium. And Paul said, I was never a fan of um, ELO except that song, Mr. Blue Sky. And that was my first coincidence. I said, well, that's really weird you should say that because only I think the day before, I'd been listening to a radio show and they'd spoken about Mr. Blue Sky. And at the end of anybody who knows the song, um, there's a kind of electronic voice, a synthesized voice, which which a lot of people assume said Mr. Blue Sky. It actually does. not What it says is, please turn me over. And it was a reference to when the, vi the, the vinyl was, was, I think it was a double vinyl and you flipped side three onto side four, hence the voice saying, please turn me over. And I'd only just learnt that fact, so I'm I'm telling Paul this, and I said at the end of the song, it breaks down, and there's kind of an instrumental bit, and and that, like a symphonic bit, and then, please turn me over, and I said, oh, right, yeah, I, did, I didn't know that either. So we, it was we, we stood there for about another twenty minutes, nothing had happened, so we said let let's pack the cameras and, and disappear. So we duly packed the boot and put our clean shoes on, jumped in the car, started the engine. It was a, I don't know why I remember it, but it was an old uh, company car. It was a, a Ford Mondeo. And the radio came on. And at that exact moment the radio came on, it was at the breakdown of 
Mr. Blue Sky, where the song breaks down into the symphonic bit, and then it said, please turn me over. And, and, I, and we know right. it's not paranormal, but I just, what are it, the chances? It's, it's a it, lottery win. It could have been any radio station, any song, any time. If we'd got in the car 20 seconds later, we'd have missed it. Mm. If we got in two minutes early, it probably wouldn't have had the same effect, but it was because we'd been speaking about that exact part of the song and we turned the radio on and it came on and it was well we just all the way i think we, we babbled about it all the way home i think i think we did well it's, it's still <laughs> I, I think about it and think what are the chances yeah yeah what are the chances but yeah fabulous and you told that a lot better than me because you knew the the sort of the the, the history yeah. of the song and yeah yeah uh, right we'll jump to les just because i think he might have a few more questions here Yes, uh, quite a few questions uh, coming in, and that was fascinating, that one, Steve. I think it is. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for telling us that one. And um, I've got to say that I'll, I'll ask Paul, maybe you could buy uh, that song for a theme tune for, for this year. Mr. Blue Skies. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Blue Skies. Yeah, give it a go, yeah. yeah. It, might, it might cost you a little bit. It oh, might cost it you a little bit. So I won't maybe. be buying it. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on, let's, let's go with question. Aldo Rain. Uh, welcome to the show, Aldo. If you're still with us, and um, do you do the guys believe the lights are attached to a craft, or are the lights operated independently? For me, they're independent. Um, I think they're all independent. I don't think there's anything uh, joining them together. I think they're all individual. Whether the lights are craft or. Uh, some kind of um you know non-physical thing i'm not sure but i don't think they're connected personally not the ones i've seen anyway no i, I wonder if there's anything behind the light mm. uh, you know whether it's the intensity of the light that's masking something not not even deliberately but uh, i can't remember location so forgive me if if, if this guy is watching this but he, he was doing a project for the mod and they gave him a property, him and his wife, overlooking the sea. Not around eastern North Yorkshire. I think we're looking like, I can't remember now, Devon Cornwall. And I have written about it. Give me a great, great account. And he saw spheres of orange stroke gold light over the sea. And his property were prime position looking out. And he put the binoculars on them and saw gold pyramids inside the light. And I mean, we've looked at we've looked in. I won't say in detail, but as, as detailed as we can do. You've got some binoculars there, Steve, that are as powerful as you can probably money can buy. And uh, we've not seen anything structured inside them. But this guy could see gold pyramids inside the light. <clears throat> it's it's actually just that's actually just. I don't know if Les have got some more questions, but I've, it's just nudged my memory about another sighting we had, which I'll we can come on to at some point. Yeah, and then we'll go to the pyramids of light. Yeah. Well, do you want to? Well, well, let me just finish this because that yep. night, uh, and he'll not he'll not mind me saying his name because it's an unusual name and it, and and it's his name. It's called John Pink, and he's in he's in Truth Proof too, and we're allowed to use his name. That night, after he'd seen the lights, they went to bed. The TV come on. They were all static. Mm. Went downstairs, turned the TV off. And then he was shown horrific scenes the, uh, throughout the night. He was shown things of horror. He, he, he said it was so vivid, and he believes it were connected to the lights he'd seen. It was so vivid that he, and, and I'm not going to go into graphic detail here, people, but it was so vivid that, he, and, and it were people that he loved that he was seeing hurt, but he could feel the blood. He could feel the warmth of the blood. On his skin and everything, and he was, and he believes that after he'd seen these lights, that was the implications. Tons and tons of people reported in the papers because he sent me all the links, and we we sort of put this together. I'm sure it was truth proof too. We put this together in the book uh, with, with all the accompanying links to people that had seen this unexplained, uh, we'll call it light form activity over the sea, over those over a few nights, but he'd seen this. And uh, yeah, yeah, it had a profound effect on him. Really, really nice guy. Really good to talk to. Articulate, and yeah, 
I've, we've not had experienced all like that, Steve, but uh, no. there's a side note, you know. So where we're we going next, Les, because uh, Steve's got a sighting that he wants to talk about. I'll maybe get a couple more questions. Yeah, in yeah, it is with them. Yeah, uh, nickname is asking, what experiments have you attempted when out on the ground? And if you've uh, uh, done any, what were the results? Uh, is this for me or Steve? Uh, there was no nobody in particular well, we, who was asking about I, I, but, I can't uh, remember the year. I think it was 2016. I did what I called the time experiments, where I was burying two uh, digital watches, both displaying the same time. I don't mean to exact second, but we just if it said seven o'clock, one might have been five seconds in front of the other. And I buried them in, in, in plastic bags, in plastic containers on the cliff tops, 400 foot apart, I think it were. I can't remember the details. I have to have paperwork in front of me. And I was inspecting them a couple of times a week, going and checking. Because uh, Why am I doing this? Because people had told me, fishermen had told me, that uh, they'd looked at the watch, and they thought, we'll fish till nine o'clock, uh, or we'll fish till one in the morning, don't quote me on a time, and then I'm off home. And then they realise when they look at the watch again and say it were half past 11, it's half past 11, an hour later, the, the watches were stopping, Straight things were happening. I don't mean on a regular basis, but that, that's the story I got, so I thought we'd try these time experiments. And I went along the cliff tops doing this, for the best part, I don't know, of a year, and I got two of the watches in one box that were telling the correct time, but they were an hour slower. And I think that's right. Don't jump on me, people, if I've got an hour and five minutes slower than the rest of them. So there were eight watches in total. We've got four boxes. And the other three are still on cliff tops. Only two that I've fetched back with me are probably on a shelf there. And I've just left them. You know what I mean? Somebody will find them in, I don't know, a few years' time and think, I don't know, what the hell's this? <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, so, and and what else are we doing? Uh, now the now the now the tourist side of it, things have sort of died down. I've got uh, I've got thermometers, digital thermometers, uh, which are displaying a time as well. And we, we we will be placing them, or we've started doing it, placing them on cliff tops in various places, not too far apart, because we've noticed fluctuations in temperature. And I, I, I'm not sure if you've come across that when we've been up on cliff tops, Steve. You may have done, and we can stand. We can oh, walk. Yeah. A, 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 not, I don't mean a few paces, but you could walk 20 foot, and it's warm. Yeah. You've got a warm spot, and and then you've you've got a cold spot. I realise that things are differing, but uh, we've got EMF meters and trifield meters, and we're putting them together with with these with the the, the thermometers and and monitoring them. We've had no results. There's nothing happened as such at the moment. We've even bought some dowsing rods and we're, we're going to have a little attempt with them. But uh, I'm open to suggestions, people. You know, that's what it's all about. It's, 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 it's your experiment as well. It's not just mine, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm quite happy to, to try to do some of the things that people might suggest. So they, I mean, we've had Andrew Collins up on cliff tops and he's He's tried to interact with these things on a different level to what I would do, you know, to, to, you know, uh, almost spiritually trying to act, interact with him. And no disrespect to Andrew, but I, it's not my thing. But he might get results. Who can say he can't, you know? So, go on, Les. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that, uh, Tracy McKay Mumbai. Ah, is hi, asking... <laughs> yes. Uh, you've, you've got a fan there, Trace. And um, Paul and Steve, has there been much activity in the Hornsea and Mappleton area? Um, there was. Oh, sorry, guys, my um, I didn't put my phone on. Um... <laughs> sorry. Um, not a, not a lot. You've had a couple of uh, a couple of sightings, haven't you, Paul? There was one night in particular when I was coming back in the car and saw some orange orbs in the sky mm. and i think i believe andy ramsden contacted you that Makes night he'd seen them as well yeah yeah so we did see some orange the sim very similar orbs to what we've been seeing on on um on the walls um and they were interesting to me because they were the sort of switching on and off thing they, they weren't just um flying through the sky that they, they were there one second then gone the next so that that was an interesting one 
um, there was a yeah. site. There's a site on the beach you're aware of as well. That's right. That's a that's a. Oldborough, I believe, or uh, maybe a little bit further down, and we we will be talking at length to this guy. I already spoke to him with Bob, and he's uh, he, you know allowed us to film him and film him and give us his account. And it was uh, Colin Keelty that put me in touch with him, and I'm I'm really grateful for that. And this guy, he were with a an, with a friend. They were sat at a bench on cliff tops. They were working up there, and. You've got the Hornsey wind turbines in the distance. We were talking about these last night because yeah. people, this this subject don't switch off for us. When we're talking about the triangle that we're seeing entering the sea at Willsthorpe, where do you think me and Steve were last night and Bob Brown? We were on the beach at Willsthorpe until the heavens opened up, stood in the darkness. So, you know, people say, well, how come you're seeing this stuff? And I'm diverting a little bit. How come you see this stuff and we don't see this stuff? Because you're not stood in these ridiculous places at ridiculous hours, maybe. So this guy, uh, and I think I'm right, is it Oldborough? And uh, he sat there having his break at a bench overlooking to see. And he'd, become, he'd, he'd seen two things a, a, few, uh, a few days apart. The first one, I think, he'd seen looked like a swarm of bees out at sea in between the land where he was sat and the wind turbines. He said, and it's a lovely clear day, he says, and so you can see everything. He says, but there's a there's a hazy bit, an oval-shaped hazy bit over the sea, almost like a swarm of bees. Points it out to his friend, and a few moments later, this this dissipates, and it's a triangle. It's a triangular-shaped object that he says just literally, this is in broad daylight on a sunny morning, skims across the water and just goes out of sight. I'm not going to say a few days later because I don't know the time frame in between. It's ages since that we've gone through story with this Nigel, this guy. But he sat there and it's, the cliffs there, what would they be, Steve? 20 foot deep and it's just earth cliffs. You could, you, yeah. you, earth, not rock, not sheer. You could, it's you, a thick person can just sort of, a, a teenager would run down them, wouldn't they? Do you know what I mean? That, that's so. What, that's what we're looking at. So be, we've got this twenty-foot cliff that he sat on edge of. The tide's fairly well in, so you've got the sand line between the tide and the cliff. We'll call it I don't know fifty, sixty foot. He said there's a triangle below the cliff, flying up the beach. The guy's with sees it. There's a lady. I think she was a cleaner that come and saw it because they're alerting people. There's a dog walker further, and they're trying to alert the dog walker. To, to see this thing, what does it do? It disappears. It, it just vanishes. It, uh, it, it's it, they, they, it, judging by the caravans on the cliff top, is estimating it to be about thirty-seven foot, perfect triangle, point to point on the beach. So, I said how long? He said about as long as a caravan. It's graphite in colour, totally silent. It's travelling along the sand between the sea and the cliff. What I find fascinating is, and so people be able to date this, I don't expect me to have the dates in my head, or there was a monstrous power outage somewhere else in the country, same day, that blamed the Hornsey wind turbines for going down. Mm. Loads of information on it, and I've not... I've, I've, I've kind of switched off from the story because there's so many things... It, itting me so many bits of information, but I make a folder and I fill it with everything I've got, just like the Flixton story that I got a few days ago, which is fascinating. And I do, I do want to touch on it before we end this tonight. It's not it's not a lengthy story, but it's, it's fascinating. So, yeah, Tracy, <laughs> to answer your question, there are a few things happening around your neck at Woods. And it was good to see you on Cliff Tops with Steve. Was it last year, Steve? Mm -hmm. Might be longer. Early this year, wasn't it? What it? What it? It's just my dementia kicking in. So, <laughs> right, where are we going? Uh, another question. I forget um, we've got this sighting of Steve's and we want to run past him. And Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, first of all, I've got to say thank you very much to Space Cow for the Super Chat donation. Space Cow is saying, great show. Uh, we'll have to rewatch. Oh, thank there you. There we go. And uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for the for the super chat donation. Don't forget, folks, 
Uh, like press buttons, any button you like, bells, yeah, whistles, and if you're the to lots. The you do time, the lot, people. Please subscribe. It's and subscribe. It's free yeah. to subscribe and press a like button. You know, let's just uh, let's just get it building. Let's get it growing. And if you have any suggestions yeah. for guests, uh, and you know these people, get in touch with them, and then get in touch with me or Les. So, and I see Warren. Thank you, Warren Ardcastle. That's 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 brilliant. So, jumping from that, Les. Yeah, I've just got like one more question. Maybe I can get in. Uh, any sightings over Farley Bay? Yeah, in a word, yeah. And that comes from Steve Lewis. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's there is a, there's a there's a police officer uh, who was with his wife, and Summer's Day. Summer tells me it was 20, 2017. Can't honestly can't remember. Although I will have it all in a folder. And he's he's, he's at Farley Brig, and he says he's looking towards Speeton. Speeton's the place, you know. We talk about Bempton, but Speeton is absolutely rich. We unexplained phenomena. He's looking towards Speeton. We know the cliffs at the highest point. Steve stood on the trig point on edge of cliff there. I took a picture of him years ago at 420. He's having a bucket, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's just, this thing looks like it's just above the cliff. So we're looking at about 450 feet in the air. And it's a white UFO. The classic UFO. His wife looked at it, he looked at it, and it comes towards them. This is why I think there's an intent, there's an intermind connection with these things. There's a couple behind them with children. They'd seen it before, the police officer and his wife. They'd seen it before, uh, because they all ended up having a conversation afterwards. This thing zigzags across the sky, so it's travelling approximately five miles from Speeton to Filey. It's doing a zigzag out to sea and in, out to sea and in, and it stays above them. So we've got to have some kind of connection here with the object and the viewer. I, I, I believe it's an impossibility not to be if that's what's happened. It says, and we're looking up at this thing, wife says it had columns that appeared to be turning and it's, it's spherical. And he's looking at it, he's saying, yeah, they are or panels almost he's, he's seeing. Uh, the couple had seen it before. It had apparently it had just been hung just above the cliffs at Speeton for quite a while, and then it set off moving. That's not the only Filey Bay one. Uh, whoever's asking about these, the, the Filey, but there's there's lots of stuff. Obviously, around Filey, Caton, Scarborough. You know, when I when we talk about Bempton, I only use that as a, as let's just stick the pin in the map. It spreads out. It's out at sea. It's inland. It's it's to the right and to the left. And if we jump to Wolflands, it's in them forests in North Yorkshire. It might be a different type of unexplained phenomena, but it's there. It's just rich. The the whole area is rich. And I'm conscious of time here, guys. So uh, have you more questions or shall we let Steve talk? Flixton. Okay. Uh, forgive me if I've, I've well last Friday, last Friday, and I'm I'm so grateful for this this man and his wife for coming through to meet me on this Sunday morning. They drove all the way back from Leeds just to show me the location and tell me what he'd seen. That tells you they've seen something genuine. They called the guy Gordon, lovely chap. I'd never met him in my life before. His wife rang me. Uh, because I think she watches the live streams. This guy ain't got an interest in unexplained phenomena. Uh, engineer working in Scarborough, driving home Friday afternoon. Pulls in at the petrol station near Harper's Chip Shop, just past the roundabout Spittle Corner, where we've had sightings of this cryptid and other things. It's very close to Carman's Spittle, the refuge uh, that were built in 937 AD. So he's, he pulls in, he says it's quiet, there's not a lot of traffic on the road, and he pulls away slowly. As he's driving up the road, he's looking to his left, and we've got fields that slope up on, I would have thought, about 30 degrees, and then we go up into the woods and we're up towards Staxton Wold and the RAF base. He said, and there's sheep in this field, and I'm looking at them. Obviously I'm not counting them, but there's sheep. He says, and I noticed there's four or five close to the side of the wood. Now, he's, the guy's been kind enough to let me film him and record him. Uh, really grateful when people do that because it, val it doesn't make what he's saying true, but it validates what I'm saying. And, I, you know, you've got to jump off fence. 
I think we've got a genuine witness here to something strange. So I look at this sheep that's about six or eight foot away from the field, the wood edge, and it's sideways on. And it's just as though something's took hold of it and just extracted it and took it into the wood. It's not a forest, it's a wood. Didn't see anything touch it. It didn't run, it didn't run into wood. It didn't back into wood. It was sideways into the wood. I find that fascinating. Now, what he's he, he absolutely stunned by what he'd seen. He rung, rang his wife, his wife quite, quite disturbed by what he'd seen. I think that'd be the words. He, he didn't expect to see something like that. No explanation for it. Couldn't have fell over. It's on an hill. Couldn't have fell in, onto ill. This thing just literally just moved sideways and went into wood and vanished. No, no cryptid to report, no UFO to report, but we've, it's a fascinating thing that uh, this guy's told me. So, so when he spoke to me about it uh, and he said he, he, he was willing to show me where, and I thought, well, he's working in Scarborough during the week. I'll, go, I'll drive through and meet him. I don't want to inconvenience him. No. Drove from Leeds Sunday morning, met up with me. We spent about 45 minutes together, myself, this guy and his wife. And he's showing me location, allowed me to film him, allowed me to record him. First class witness, absolutely brilliant to something I've no explanation for. I don't, I don't think we'll ever get an explanation for it, but I find it fascinating. So, Lee, yeah, that's, that's basically it. It's not, uh, I'm not going to tell you that it's, it's, there's something ran out of wood and grabbed this thing and ran off with it because we haven't got that. We've got something invisible, for want of a better word, extracting something from a field. Fascinating. Am I going to get in touch with Farmer? Yes. Am I going to go into Flixton Wold? Yes. Have I done it? No. I've, I've been a little bit tired, to be honest, last, last week or so, but uh, I will be doing it. Right, that's Flixton done. So where are we going? Yes, uh, you've got another story, haven't you, Paul, uh, with Steve? Uh, Steve has, yeah. Yeah, th this was one that um, I had actually forgotten about, and I'm surprised because it was a really good one. And I'm, it's one of those where I think if we'd have had better equipment at the time, we could have made more of it and seen more mm. of it. If you remember, we'd gone up towards, um, we'd gone through Sledmere and gone on the Malton Road. So we're at Malton, um, up towards, the on the Warren Percy section of the road, I think, and we're looking but over... What you're the... talking about is on is on our YouTube, so yeah, carry on. It is, yeah, I was going to say that. You've got you've got the film footage of it, mm. um, but it, to see it, it, it was quite remarkable at the time. It was over... Um, it looked to be over towards Wetwang from where mm. from where we were stood, and two off, two red lights... You need to explain that language to people, because Wetwang is a village. <laughs> <laughs> Wetwang's a village with a very good chip shop. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, uh, two two red lights over wet one. They were, they seem to be. I think um, I want to say it might have been um, Aldo was asking. Aldo Rain was asking about whether these things were connected. These two did seem to be connected, and that, that's what jogged my memory. It was almost like they had a beam between them. I couldn't see it, but it, it felt like it did. And the two lights were fairly intense. And we spotted them, and then they decided to sort of spin on their axis. Um, but they kept equidistant at all times. And then gradually they, they sort of floated off into the distance and faded. Um, and it was a, I want to say it was a fairly close sighting, but I'm just gutted we didn't have the P900s at that time. That's correct. It was filmed yeah. once again with Sony VX21. Mm. And, and it were red, weren't it? It were a red <laughs> colour. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, it, it was really interesting. And, and as a side note, you know, uh, that was filmed in 2009. Mm. Can't remember exact date. And uh, in 2014, a website, which I won't, I'm not even going to give them, I'm not even going to give them ear, earshot of me saying whose website it is. The news, the internet went viral with, uh, what was it, uh, Dazzling UFO filmed over Lincolnshire. Mm. So, and when, when I clicked and looked at this dazzling UFO filmed over Lincolnshire, it was what me and you filmed in 2009. But the chopped Paul Sinclair's ILF UFO off it, the chopped really? the back off it, 
And I copied and pasted and contacted, because it literally went every website all over the place were looking at this thing. The contact has began. And I contacted the bloke who'd put it on and he sent me a, a message back. I'm sorry if I sound a bit bitter here, people, but I've not forgot because I will drop on this person eventually and I want to speak to him face to face. He sent me a message back going, me no understand. So I contacted YouTube and they took his site down because I said, I've done this in 2009. That's the kind of thing that you're dealing with. People are just robbing other people's material. It weren't the world beating smoking gun of ufology, but that's what you're dealing with. Can you remember that? Oh, absolutely. It, yeah. was a, it was a great sighting. That, that was one of the better ones because it wasn't fully dark either. No. Uh, it, it, was, it was sort of a dusk light. And they said, I just rue the fact that we didn't have the P900s and the big binoculars back then, because I think... Yeah, because we would have got something a lot better, without a doubt. But that was a cracking sight in that one. So, I mean, we've covered we've covered quite a lot of things here, Steve. You know, I mean, <laughs> and I, there may be a few more questions to come in uh, be, before we end this, but what about uh, Sproutley? Oh, gosh, yeah, the, the, um, that, was a, that was a crazy story. You, Muriel you... and Sandra Robottom. Yeah, so Muriel and Sandra were mother and, mother and daughter. Daughter, and they contacted ILF UFO, I believe, at the time. That's the right. And they had this phenomenal sort of—I um, wouldn't even call it a sighting. It was more of a close encounters, really. <laughs> yeah, um, the, the, they were living uh, sprotly. And there 1994. Was, yeah. The, the, the sightings, the, the, they'd started, Paul, Paul can probably say the details more, but they'd started seeing the lights in the sky. And apparently one night the, the whole sky was lit up with this orange UFO. And then um, I can't remember the timeline, but the alien, they, 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 they went to the curtains to close the curtains and they saw some beings in the garden. And they took some quite interesting, they managed, one of them, we didn't have, the camera phones weren't a thing then, so they had managed to grab a camera and snap some pictures. And there's some really, I wouldn't say detail, but really weird pictures on there. Which uh, they've got, uh, it, was, it was the daughter that, that took the pictures from above the sink. That's right. On her they, hands and knees. They hid in the kitchen. And they hid in the kitchen, that, yeah. And they were, they were an interesting... I mean, when we went, we we drove to Nairsborough, they lived at, because mm. this sighting was at Sproutley, which is close to Aldborough, isn't it? And, uh, and, yeah, it's just inland a little bit on the way yeah. to And uh, But they'd moved to Nairsborough, and when we went to, to visit them, uh, you know, and they, they showed us the pictures, they showed us everything they'd got and told us. It was interesting that, and I've said this before, but the mum, quite getting on in years, she perceived these things as angels and the daughter perceived them as aliens. Once again, yeah. it's a cultural, cultural thing that, you know, and uh, it's, it's the way that we, we look at things through different eyes as, 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 as things have evolved. And, For me, uh, sorry, okay. sorry to jump in. For me, that was the element that made me believe that they'd, they'd seen what they'd seen because they were actually almost arguing with each other over what they'd seen. They yeah. were describing the same thing. Um, but one of the mum was she was she had religious iconography in the house. She had, you know, pictures of Jesus and stuff. So she was clearly a religious woman. And her perception was it's angels from God. And the daughter was saying, actually, it wasn't. It was it was aliens. They were aliens. Yeah. Um, and they, they showed us the negatives, didn't they? Yes, they did. Yeah. Because there was um, there were some old fashioned negatives um, and they were they said they'd seen a, a white cross within the negative, a glowing white cross. Floating. Floating in the negative. Um, and a, another investigator, shall we say, had been and tried to sort of commandeer this stuff. You tried to steal it, didn't he? Tried to steal it, yeah. Mm. Uh, they, they said they didn't have it in their possession, so they couldn't show them it, and so it, it couldn't be taken away. But we must have made a different impression on these two because they actually let us, they actually did have it in the house and they let us see it. Yeah. Uh, we studied the, the, the negative for quite some time, but we, we, we couldn't see anything floating in it, but who's to say that they hadn't, uh, I, I, you know, 
it, with the nature of what we're looking at, it, I don't suppose you can rule anything out, but 100% I never saw anything within the negative. But it was interesting. Uh, they'd had a bad experience. I mean, when we got there, the son, big burly lad, was, was kind of like a bodyguard for him, weren't he? Yeah, because yeah, of the yeah. bad experience that they'd had with other ufologists. Yes. Uh, if that's the name for him. You know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, an interesting an interesting one. And uh, I wonder I wonder where the photographs are. I mean, they allowed us to take photographs of the photographs, which I've put in book one. You that's have it. some, but you've lost them. I, <laughs> I actually lost the transcript of the interview I did as well. Um, yeah. which, it will turn up somewhere, but because um, you do sort of forget the fine. Well, actually, you've got a good memory for the detail, but... You do forget the finer details, but um, yeah. it was a really interesting story. And they were clearly, whatever they'd seen, they totally believed they'd seen it. There was no, there's no dispute in that fact. Because they even said at one point that they thought it had followed them to Nesborough, if you remember. Yeah, I do, yeah. Out of the window where they live now or where they were living then. Um, and, and they were adamant that um, it had followed them across. Well, I'll tell you what I found out afterwards, and it, obviously we never got any detail from her husband. I don't, I don't know whether he'd passed away or whether he, he, he just chose not to be around when we, we interviewed these ladies, but he was a Coast Guard. All right. Yeah, do you know, it's a fascinating, really, because to, to have got his take on what was actually seen. Mm. But, uh, yeah, that, that's another... Another story. It looks like we've got about nine minutes left if Les has got any questions he wants to fit in. <clears throat> yeah, Paul uh, is just asking about your health. How are you feeling, Paul? I, I'm and, feeling uh, loads better, but I, I need to give me head a shake, really, people, because I'm 59, not 29, and sometimes I think I am. And I, it re whatever it was, don't want to dwell on it, it just knocked me on my backside. And, uh, yeah, and I've done a few things today, and I've been sat down tired. Well, in <laughs> In fairness, Paul, in all the years I've known you, I've never known you to be sickly. So for you, no, to... it's weird. Twenty years, I've ne yeah. never been to doctors. Yeah, but there you go. But thank you. All good now. Hopefully. Yeah, Patricia, Patricia Adams, right? Is asking Steve, did you get to examine the glowing tree? Do you know what? I went over and there was just nothing. There was literally nothing. Um, I, funny enough, I drive past it. Not so much these days, but I was working up that way and I used to drive past it all the time and, and look. And, 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 and interestingly, it's only a stone's throw from the valley where Paul's witness saw the egg with the two beings. And I, I always look in the in the valley as well. Um, but yeah, there was, there was nothing of any note. The tree's still there. It grows perfectly well. I've, I've um, you know, it was just a really unusual experience. Never seen anything like it before or since. Uh, I've just looked in online and Outer Limits, Chris Evers just could wasn't Sandra and her husband divorced by them, Paul? Chris, you probably know better than me because I think you pro you got closer to to maybe speaking to him or Philip Mantle did. We we came into it afterwards. That that, that were 1994, so other people will have spoken to these these two ladies. So yeah, you're probably right, Chris. And it wasn't Chris who tried to steal it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it weren't Chris Evers who tried to steal the negatives. No, once Nick to tenor off me. <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> Just no. So uh, yeah, there we go. So right. More questions, because we're, we're just about... G. Hawkins, yeah, G. Hawkins uh, is asking just a question for Stephen Paul. Has Steve had any sightings similar to the three parasites, and also have there been any further cryptid-type similar sightings recently? Uh, well, for, for my for my own, uh, there's there's been things seen on cliff tops. I mean, it doesn't add up that these things could be living and breathing there, but I'm sort of covering all ground. I'm repeating myself every week with this one. But Steve, I, I go up there. I don't go up there as much on my own now because I've just learned so much from lots of different people, and it does it does make you think. Uh, as if I still go. But I were up there one night, and we're probably going to go back about five or six years, and we'd we'd walked further than where the 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 military guys had had their experience, and suddenly, and it, it's it's fear overcome me. I don't know what it was, prickly skin, 
this is not a regular occurrence, people. It, uh, you know, it's just not. And I said to Steve, I said, I'm frightened. I feel frightened. You didn't feel it, did you? He says, I don't know. I said, Steve, I said, it feels like I'm being watched. I don't like it. I feel frightened. We've got about a mile to walk, haven't we, before we got to got back to cars, you know, and that's in a remote place where cars were. And it was horrible. The, a, a, a proper fear descended, and it weren't because we talked about things and kind of spoke to each other because we're not we're not into that. You know, we've we've been we've done this for like like twenty five years, and and sort of covered lots of ground and been in lots and lots of places. I've been more frightened of cows chasing me than, <laughs> than, yeah, than well, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's true. Well, but yeah. a proper what, what fear in, overtook me that night. What's interesting about that comment is, I never felt it, but ninety nine times out of one hundred, we can be at Benton, we can be on the at Cottom, and everything's fine, everything's cool, it's pleasant atmosphere. You're talking about whatever music, Mister Blue Sky, and but then all of a sudden, sometimes the atmosphere just it just turns on a sixpence, and ninety nine times out of one hundred, we both feel it, or whoever's yeah. feel it at the same time. It's almost like. The atmosphere closes in. Something just gives, and you're not in this nice, pleasant green land anymore. You're in a really remote, spooky um, environment. Yeah. The only time it's ever happened where we didn't both feel it was the time Paul's talking about. Yeah. And I, I didn't get any of that vibe at all. But no, I, I did. When Paul got back, he, he, he was. He, I could tell he was really shaken. Yeah, I, I don't know what it was. One and only time that, that that's happened to me, but it happened. Right, Les. Um, Three minutes just, to go, guys. Sorry, could I just um, going back to the cryptid thing? The question: I've never seen a cryptid uh, or anything that resembles one. I don't believe. I did, however, see somebody in a pub, and I swear that I hadn't. Had... Oh, I don't know what you're going to say. The red eyes. Yeah. yeah. Guy looked around, and he was stood at the bar, and he looked at me, and his eyes were red. Only for a brief second, his eyes were bright red, and then he looked away. And that re really creeped me out. No, no, no. So yeah, wasn't the gin? Wasn't the gin? Was well, it? Steve? I wasn't drinking gin then. I wasn't drinking. Gin. Uh, no, I mean for him. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, could have been. Yeah, bloodshot. But no, he, they seemed to be glowing, and it was only a brief, brief glimpse, but it was enough to really put me on edge. Okay, could, uh, might get two quick answers from you uh, with a couple of minutes to go. Mark Egan is asking Paul about your illness. Could it be related to your implants? Uh, I don't know if you have any implants. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I, I don't know. And, and I don't, I, I wouldn't even know if I'd got implants. I've got marks on my body that have, have appeared over the years after some kind of strange interaction. Let's put it that way. But Mark, I don't know, mate. I, honestly, and uh, I, I, I'm not going to be one of these people that say, "Oh, yeah, I've got an implant," because I don't know. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's that's as close I can get to it. Okay, P Patricia Adams, right, is asking, uh, "Hi guys, uh, what's been the psychological impact of these sightings uh, on you? If if, if you've had any uh, psychological impacts, <laughs> you can get that done within about sixty seconds." F for me. <laughs> Um, I, I've not had anything that's that scared me enough to, to make me want to stop doing it. All I've had is it, it's given me enough to want to keep doing it. Mm. Um, that that that's that's the only impact it's had on me. I've seen so much stuff that doesn't add up. Um, like Paul, I mean, I can't devote as much time to it as Paul. Um, but for me, it's it's just wanting to find out what it is and, and why. Well, well uh, yeah, the impact, I suppose, for me, is is uh, are the things that happened in childhood. But now it's listening to the people, the people like the guy who come to visit me, at Flixton, and telling me that, that it, it, it's it's overwhelming that that when you've got all these people coming at you, uh, wanting to share experiences and wanting to travel two hours their own vehicle, their own fuel, to because to, it's made such an impression on them that uh, that we'd be doing them an injustice not to not to not to talk about these things because it's there, it's there, it's happening, it's out there, and we 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 need to get the word out there that these extraordinary things are real, no matter how implausible they might be, they're real. 
And on that note, I've got to ask you guys to uh, say good night. Well, it's been brilliant, Steve. Thank you very much. I hope we can do it again. Still Absolutely. About it. There's, a, there's a few more bits and pieces we can talk about. I could go on forever. Thank you. Right. Nice. You. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Paul. It uh, just uh, remains for me to say thanks, everybody, for joining us on the live stream tonight. Uh, and I've got to thank uh, the recent... Uh, Super chat what came in from Lee Roscoe. Thanks, Lee, for the uh, £10. And I think Lee said, what a fantastic show as yeah, always. Thank you, Thanks for your time tonight, yeah. Steve, and hope you're well, kidder. I think you means you were there, Paul. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, th yeah, thank you very much. So, thanks for everybody's uh, questions. I think I nearly got them all out. Uh, probably somebody might say I didn't get theirs out, but I've tried my very best, and I always try my best Thanks, every Liz. week. We've got a great guest. Got a great guest on next week. Uh, I think we're going to America. Oklahoma. Right, we're off to Oklahoma. We're off to Oklahoma for uh, an experience. experience uh, fabulous. An experience. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's going to be a great show as well. But on that note, I've got to thank Steve Ashbridge and Paul Sinclair. And from me, Les Drake uh, from Digital Creations, producer of the Truth Proof Show. Good night. <laughs>